my radio crew back there. Hey, hey it's, it's, it's great to see everybody. Happy Friday. Because we've got everyone together, I just want to say thanks for everything you're doing. I mean, there are a lot of tremendous initiatives underway, right? So some of you might have thought, hey, we published the AOC, time to go to Disney World, right? Oh. No, <laughs> hey, it's, it's, there's lots of work to do on the follow. It's just the beginning, right? So we're laying a strong conceptual foundation for our modernization. We have a framework for analyzing how well we're doing, what we need to do in the future, the Army War Fighting Challenges. We've got a way to learn about future armed conflict and what Army Forces have to do in the future and what our required capabilities are, which is Force 2025 maneuvers. And then based on what we're learning and our analysis of what we're learning from our analytical team, we're now able to set priorities and bridge into implementation and, and begin building the future force. And the work that you've done has generated a tremendous possibility for Army, potential for our Army, to even in a period of diminished resources, to make sure that our soldiers and our units in the future have what they need to overmatch the enemy and accomplish the mission across the range of military operations. So I'm really, really proud of all of you. I want to say you have to enjoy your weekend. You deserve it. And uh, what a better way to start our weekend than to give us something to think about. And, uh, and so I, I really, it's a real privilege uh, for us to have Wick, Wick Murray here today. And, and I'll talk a little bit about him and, and turn it over to Bulldog for the introduction. But I want to just welcome a few, a few members of our extended family here. First of all, Ginger Perkins, thanks so much for being here t today. Uh, Joe Perkins would have been here, but he's flying to Europe uh, this afternoon. Uh, and, and, and it's very sorry he's going to miss it here, Wick. And, but Ginger, thanks so much for being with us. With Captain Eric Peterson for Georgia Staff J7. See you here? Thank you, sir. Oh, hey, hey man. Good to see you. I'm losing my scouting ability. Can't pick up the Navy captain on the track. <laughs> good, 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 to see, good to see you. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for being here. And then uh, Mr. Bill Odom from J7 also, who's an old friend. And, and uh, I'll tell you, if you want to read a great book about innovation in interwar period, read Bill Odom's book, William Odom's book, After the Trenches. And it talks about how our Army attempted to learn lessons from World War I and apply them uh, in, in preparation for the next armed conflict in a period of, of a lot worse resourcing than we have today. So, so it's a really relevant book to our job there as well. Mr. Th Mr. Tom Snookus from uh, the JCWS, the, the uh, joint, uh, uh, the joint, <coughs> combined, combined work by school, sorry. I was a graduate of that school, and he was my professor there. So uh, that's another great, great to have here, Tom. And he was an awesome, uh, awesome colonel of our army and a great guy to talk to. I want to thank, uh, who's your AUSA? Hey, I know we got, we got Don Lizenby. Where's Don? Over here? Okay, Don. And uh, who else do you have with you today? Brad here? Brad should be here. I'm here. Okay, Brad Hermitage. Anybody else from AUSA? Bob Bridgeford. Yeah, I just want to say thanks to you guys for, you know, for really hosting us tonight. And I uh, really appreciate the tremendous support from your organization across, across the board. We also have tonight members of the Major General James Wright Fellowship at William & Mary. And this is where active duty officers gave their master's degrees in, in, a, in a broad range, right, of disciplines, aren't it? Or are you guys all MBAs? What are you guys doing? MBA, sir. All getting MBAs, uh, which is, is, you know, is a tremendous good value to Army. Please stand up, you guys, so we can all introduce ourselves to you. And you guys are all captains and, and majors, right, captains? Yes, sir. All captains. All right, so so uh, inter we'll introduce your, ourselves to these guys and pull them into some of the work we're doing, maybe you know, as, as consultants. So thanks. Affordable <laughs> 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 consultants. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> That's right. Affordable <laughs> consultants. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, okay, uh, Mr. Don and Carol Buchwald, uh, are, are, and, and is Lucy is Lucy here? <clears throat> okay, Lucy, and you're here with your parents. Yes. Okay, now Lucy is an unsung hero of Tradoc and Arkin. She's our librarian. Okay. Yeah. And we're about to hear from, I think, the most eminent historian of, of his uh, generation, uh, Wick Murray. And, and, uh, and it's a reminder that really nothing that we're doing today is unprecedented, right? And so Lucy's the one who helps us access you know, the lessons of the past, what we've done in the past, the documentary records of. Of, of how TRADOC and, and our forerunner organizations have thought about future war and, and built capabilities. So, uh, so, so please introduce yourself to Lucy and, and her parents and thank her for the great work that she does for us. So well, again, welcome everybody. I appreciate the great work you're doing. It's great to have extended members of the family here uh, this, this afternoon. 
and I'll turn it over to, 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 uh, to Bulldog. You have, you have Luke's bio here, but I've just got to tell you, there's no historian, no scholar who I have relied on more than, than uh, William Shemurian in terms of how to think about our job in particular, how we try to anticipate the demands of future armed conflict, and then prepare future forces to fight and win. Right? And it's, it's hard stuff, right? As, as Sir Michael Howard has said, you know, that we're never going to get it right, right? You're, 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 you know, what you have to do is, is try to be, to, to, to not be so wrong that you can't adjust to the real demands of conflict once they reveal themselves to you. So, so there's nobody better to talk to us uh, about, about our profession and, and our role here and, and, our, and our mission here at uh, Arctic in the trade Ox. So, hold on. Thank you, sir. It's uh, once again my honor to uh, welcome you to the bi-monthly Arctic Distinguished Speaker Series. It began in September of last year, and we had uh, Professor Alex Rowland, who spoke on technology and armed conflict. He was followed by Professor Brian Lynn, who provided insight on recovering from the last war and preparing for future wars. As sponsored by Director Arctic, you know, the, the uh, Distinguished Speaker Series continues to invite professional commentators and academics present on a range of topics that stimulate professional discussion and debate relative to the Army's future land warfare environment. By employing the vast knowledge and experience of some of the best thinkers, educators, practitioners of history, technology, and warfare, we are afforded the unique opportunity to broaden our creative thinking and problem-solving skills, especially with regards to concepts and capability development and integration. The ARCHIC Distinguished Speaker Series fully supports the intent of the Army Leader Development Program established in DAPAM 350-58. Today's guest speaker, <coughs> Dr. William S. Murray, graduated from Yale University in 1963 with honors in history. He then served five years as an officer in the United States Air Force, including a tour in Southeast Asia, 314th Tactical Airlift Wing, C-130s. Dr. Murray returned to Yale University, where he received his PhD in military diplomatic history. He taught two years in the Yale History Department before moving on to Ohio State University in 1977. There, he was a military and diplomatic historian as well. He received the Alumni Distinguished Teaching Award in 1987. In 1995, Dr. Murray took an early retirement from Ohio State as Professor Emeritus of History. Dr. Murray has taught at a number of academic and military institutions, including the Air War College, the United States Military Academy, and the Naval War College. He further served as a consultant with the Institute of Defense Analysis, where he worked on the Iraq Perspective Project. Dr. Murray has just completed a two-year stint as a Minerva Fellow at the Naval War College and is at present serving as an adjunct professor at the Marine Corps University. He has written a wide selection of articles and books, some of which are in your handout. At present, he has uh, completed two manuscripts for Cambridge, the Iran-Iraq War, 1980-1988, with Kevin Woods, as well as an edited volume titled Successful Strategies with co-editor Richard Sinrich, from which he will be orating on naval innovation in the interwar period, 1920-1940. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Murray. Who Uh, for the uh, kind introductions. Uh, I've known uh, General McMaster since he was a major, visiting uh, 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 Washington, D.C., where I had just arrived and thought I wouldn't stay long, but fortunately I had to stay for a long time. Let me, let me start with uh, uh, a little Churchill story to sort of uh, get, get us on the right road about how important our profession is. Uh, in 19, April 1938, Winston Churchill was uh, giving an oration at the House of Commons about how Britain needed more air defense, certainly something that he got right. Um, and in the middle of his oration, the uh, backbencher, this happens in the House of Commons, shouted out, how much is enough? Churchill paused, thought for a minute, and said, well, that reminds me of a man who received a telegram from Brazil 
The telegram said, your mother-in-law dead, wire instructions. And Churchill paused and said, so the man wired back, embalm, cremate, bury at sea, take no chances. <laughs> Um, let me begin uh, by uh, um, moving to a, a short discussion of the problem of history. As, uh, as a uh, um, uh, tool uh, uh, to learn from. Uh, and so can we go to, I don't have a flash, can we go to the uh, next slide, whoever's back there, slide after this. <coughs> Um, I would argue one of our major problems uh, um, in terms of understanding history is that the, the narrative that's often captured by people who are not really interested in, in, in if you uh, will, what happened, um, uh, it's captured by people who wanted to twist the narrative to, uh, to make themselves look better um, uh, or to uh, come up with uh, a facile, easy explanation. Um, I put a few of these up here. Um, the Southern view of Civil War history, which uh, lasted really for nearly 100 years until the 1960s when it began to break down. The whole idea that so somehow um, the war took an interminable long time uh, uh, um, uh, to end because of uh, sort of uh, um, uh, the stupidity of the North and the fact that they, uh, um, Grant was a butcher, we could run through a whole long list of nonsensical um, uh, pictures of great southern uh, performance on the battlefield, which of course really e ended up about uh, uh, nothing more than the Virginia uh, theater of operations, because if you look out west, um, the southern armies in the west did even worse than the Army of the Potomac, which is really an extraordinary negative achievement. Um, capture, uh, again, the, the, the second point up there, dereliction of duty, comes from General McMaster's uh, wonderful book, which uh, literally blew up the, the idea that somehow the Vietnam War was entirely the responsibility of evil politicians who never listened to the military. In fact, the military had, uh, as General McMaster's uh, wonderful book uh, underlines, uh, a substantial hand in what, what was a catastrophe for the United States, even more so for the uh, Vietnamese. Um, the other two, well, uh, German military in World War II. I, I might point out that I started off my academic career as, a, uh, as an historian who thought that we had a great deal to learn from the German military. And it, in some ways, I would argue, in a tactical sense, we did. Uh, but in fact, uh, I have turned into, uh, over the last uh, three quarters of my academic career, into uh, an historian who, who uh, um, uh, spends a great deal of time underlining that people who don't bother to understand strategy or even logistics end up losing wars. And the German record uh, in terms of major wars of 0 and 2 suggests uh, um, that uh, they might not be quite as good a, an example for us to follow. Um, let me move to the uh, Navy uh, and the view of the Navy from 19... Uh, uh, 20 to 1941 that uh, uh, um, really dominated, if you will, discussions from 1945 uh, through to uh, um, the uh, 1990s. So the US <coughs> Navy was uh, run by battleship admirals, four battleship admirals, had no interest in innovation, had little interest in changes, um, and uh, that uh, only, uh, if you will, uh, the heroic efforts of a few Navy pilots uh, in the system uh, saved uh, um, the Navy uh, from uh, um, catastrophe in the Second World War. <clears throat> in fact, um, what we have discovered um, in terms of a number of, uh, of books uh, that were written in the 1990s, which, which I summarized uh, in a, my chapter in uh, the Successful Strategies book um, is that uh, um, both at the strategic level, in terms of technological innovation, operational innovation, and tactical innovation, the Navy did an extraordinary job uh, in the period of 1920 to 1941 in preparing for the war and then in adapting to the actual conditions that it confronted in the Second World War. Um, and, and finally, um, Alan Lutton and I have had a conversation about 
uh, sort of the Marine Corps narrative of the uh, um, interwar period, sort of that we Marines only did it by ourselves and everybody else was against us, the Army and the Navy. And, uh, in fact, um, missed the larger point, which was that the Marine Corps was part of the larger cultural framework of the United States Navy in terms of innovation uh, and adaptation. <coughs> and at least I would argue that, uh, and I may someday write a piece on it, <coughs> the Army <coughs> and the uh, um, Army Air Forces were far more adaptive and innovative than they're given credit to by the historical narrative um, when w one takes into account the actual context within which they were working. So let me move to the uh, next uh, slide. Have some key. Uh, definitions here, uh, and they are, if you will, a direct imposition on, uh, 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 on terms that could be used a little bit more broadly, but what I'm trying to do is suggest uh, by using these, uh, these terms is that uh, innovation uh, is a process of change during peacetime um, in which military institution uh, have some considerable difficulties because the kind of uh, changes in technology and changes, uh, if you will, in the international environment presented with a constant series of changes to which they have to uh, um, adapt. The, the advantage, of course, is that uh, um, they have plenty of time. The disadvantage is, uh, is that they may not have enough money, uh, and even more seriously, they may uh, uh, they confront the, the problem that some considerable um, aspects of future war cannot be replicated in peace uh, I'm going to come back to that. Adaptation, uh, again, I might point out one of the more successful books that I've edited um, uh, is the innovation book that Alan Millett and I put out in the mid-1990s. Uh, um, again, a substantial portion of these uh, um, efforts were funded by the Office of Net Assessment, Andrew Marshall, the, uh, one of the truly great thinkers and uh, 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 Americans, headed from 1972 until January of this year when he retired after 42 years uh, in the same office. Um, I don't know how he did it because, uh, um, uh, by and large, uh, uh, his, uh, uh, his um, uh, efforts were not paid sufficient attention to by, uh, by the DOD. Um, adaptation, Andy uh, funded uh, for, for me um, uh, considerably later, about 10 years later, it took me a considerable amount of, uh, of time uh, to persuade him uh, uh, to let me do the uh, study because um, uh, he said, well, adaptation is just like innovation. Uh, and I was finally able to persuade him that no, it's different in the sense that in wartime, um, in terms of, of adapting to the conditions of combat, you have relatively little time to adapt. And not only that, you confront the very difficult problem that your opponent is adapting at the same time you are. Uh, and that it's something which uh, um, uh, deserved study, and so Andy supported it. Uh, and uh, again, I, I produced, uh, in this case, uh, um, all the case studies myself. Um, Improvisation, and this is something which uh, a couple of Admiral friends uh, pushed me to, it's really the third element uh, in which, um, as HR uh, suggested, um, is a major problem that uh, uh, Michael Howard uh, underlined, that military organizations always get the next war wrong for perfectly sensible reasons, because the future is not context, the political context, the nature of the enemy, um, the conditions of war, um, popular uh, uh, opinion, none of that uh, is predictable. Um, uh, and therefore, how well um, uh, military organizations are able to improvise um, when caught by surprise is, is an essential element. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, we've got a couple of quotes here. Um, which I pretty much summed up. Uh, uh, the last one is, I think, the really important one. Uh, uh, Clausewitz is, in the dreadful presence of suffering and danger, emotion can easily overwhelm intellectual conviction. And in this psychological fog, it is hard to form clear and complete insights. 
Nowhere in consequence are differences of opinion so acute as in war, and fresh opinions never cease to batter one's convictions. Um, again, I, I think one of the debates which is re-emerging uh, and is essential, um, uh, we saw this debate in the 1990s where a substantial people, a number of people in the, uh, particularly in the Air Force, uh, but also the Navy arguing that uh, um, the fundamental nature of war had changed. Um, uh, that friction uh, and the capacity, if you will, of the opponent uh, uh, against the technological capability of the United States military was such that uh, um, we were no longer going to exist in the world of friction. Um, I think our experiences for the last 15 years have should have put that um, to bed. Um, I'm happy to say that it did not. Um, um, actually, I should say I'm not happy to say it, it did not. Um, let me go to uh, the next slide. We can skip over that, and I want to go to Naval Innovation, 1920 to 1930. Um, it's very interesting, the, the initial push um, by Andrew Marshall's office uh, in terms of uh, innovation was looking at German innovation in the 20s uh, uh, and 30s. Uh, uh, and I think that interest was obviously sparked by the fact the German military did so well in 1939, 40, 41, coming pretty close to destroying, if you will, uh, the global balance of power. Um, that began to change, and again, uh, here's where Andrew Marshall has written really encouraged historians by giving them small, little dollops of money. You know, kind of pretty cheap compared to uh, people like uh, Rand and Ida. Um, the, the Navy began to emerge uh, in the uh, 1990s um, uh, as an institution that really deserved particular uh, interest. Uh, um, and um, a number of really crucial books have appeared. Let me mention some of them. Um, my own book that Millette and I did on innovation is there. But the really important books were by Tom Hone uh, and Mark Mandalis on the uh, uh, carrier innovation in the 20s and 30s, which is really a fascinating story of how innovation should be done. And I'll say a few words about that in a few minutes. Steve Rosen did a very important book uh, on uh, on, uh, if you will, how the culture of military organizations changes and had some very interesting words to say about the, the culture of, of uh, the Navy. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, Dr. Noffy's book published by the Naval uh, uh, War College on the fleet exercises is, I think, one of the most fascinating books on military culture that is working effectively that I've ever read. Again, I'll have a few words to say about that. Uh, and then Thomas Kuhn's book, uh, <coughs> a naval officer who's out te teaching out at uh, Leavenworth um, on the general board. Again, the historical narrative suggested that the general board was a bunch of really silly old admirals who had not a clue. In fact, it turns out that it was a very innovative, imaginative bo uh, board um, that foresaw, among other things, that a uh, uh, um, uh, carriers that had, if you will, uh, um, I can't think of what it's called, the, uh, uh, the side deck uh, going off uh, uh, might be an important uh, innovation uh, that the Navy did not follow up on. What this allowed me to do, I would argue, in my uh, uh, in the chapter that I wrote in the Successful Strategies book on the Navy in the 20s and 30s, uh, is to put, a, I think, a more coherent picture. Um, on what made successful innovation work or not work. Um, the larger issue which this has raised that I'm hoping to do a study with uh, some of my friends uh, is the, the larger enabler we, we believe is, was the culture within which the Navy worked in the 20s and 30s. And uh, its subset, which was much more closely tied to it, the Marine Corps, clearly was also influenced by this culture of questioning, debate, argument, uh, during a period of substantial technological change. Um, I think, again, one of the things that strikes me about military historians is that we have often ignored some of the really far more important uh, uh, 
um, issues uh, in military history that would be useful both to ourselves to understand and what has happened and why uh, in warfare, but also to modern military institutions to, to uh, understand themselves. And that's the culture of military organizations. Um, and a number of different factors uh, um, uh, work in it. And perhaps I can answer some questions when uh, we get uh, to it. Do we have the next slide? Um, the Navy was, in fact, in 1920, a battleship Navy. Um, it was forced um, by the conditions of the First World War to participate in the anti-submarine warfare, but like the Royal Navy, uh, the United States Navy um, was dominated by battleships and battleship uh, admirals. And in spite of this initial domination, what I find particularly interesting is that over the period of 20 years, the Navy created an entirely different uh, way of war. It adapted to technological changes. And one of the most interesting sort of technological changes that occurs is that in terms of its aircraft, uh, the Navy uh, uh, um, confronted uh, in the early 1920s the, the debate among aircraft engineers that which type of engine, an inline engine or a radial engine, would be best for uh, to build the fastest, speediest uh, aircraft, uh, combat aircraft. Um, and by and large, the, uh, um, the engineers were coming down solidly on the side of inline engines. The carrier development, which begins with the Langley and then moves on to the uh, Saratoga uh, and the Lexington in the mid to late uh, 20s, forced the Navy um, to recognize that inline engines were not the way to go for carrier because they were far too hard to maintain on a, a pitching deck of a carrier. But if you wanted to fix, if you will, a piston on, a, uh, on a, an inline engine, you had to drop the engine and pull it off. And in a pitching uh, um, aircraft carrier uh, on the high seas, this was not the easy thing to do. And inline, excuse me, a, um, uh, a um, radial engine, however, uh, you could literally pull out uh, um, uh, the cover uh, and get uh, to work on the piston uh, uh, right away. And because it pushed the development of radial engines throughout the interwar period, a number of things happened. By the early 1930s, um, engineers had discovered that, in fact, the radial engine could uh, give you as much power as an inline <laughs> engine. The difficulty, of course, is, is you lost a certain amount had increased drag, but not something that could not, uh, that could not be uh, overcome. The, this is one of the uh, unintended effects of, of serious innovation, um, is that this then, from the Navy's development of fighter aircraft, moved in in the uh, early to mid-1930s to commercial aircraft like the DC-3, built on radio engines, because radio engines were much easier for um, uh, airlines to fix, and if it's easier to fix, it costs less money. Um, and this led to, um, uh, in terms of development of the uh, um, U.S. Army Air Forces, to an Air Force which used radio <coughs> engines rather than inline engines. But if you look at uh, U.S. aircraft in the Second World War, with the exception of the P-51, which, oh, by the way, was partially designed uh, for the British and carried a British engine, uh, the uh, Rolls-Royce engine in it, um, all American combat aircraft were radio engines, which were much easier to fix um, when you were dealing with the fact that our combat power was deployed on the other side of oceans. <coughs> again, one of the, one of the major factors, uh, which again, I, in terms of changing my view towards American military organization, is the huge emphasis on logistics that American services had in World War II reflected that, that we were projecting power over two of the world's biggest oceans. And I think, uh, again, well worth uh, underlining that, in fact, um, tr true military effectiveness re rests to a great extent on the capacity of logistics to support uh, the people in the field. Um, <clears throat> let me turn to the enablers of um, of, uh, of innovation, and they were a, a number of them. 
um, the concepts required for war across the Pacific uh, come out of the Naval War College, not the Navy staff, uh, to come out of the serious long-term thinking that took place between 1920 uh, and 1939 at, at the Naval War College. Uh, and again, I think one of the huge differences between the American military in the 20s and 30s, the American military today, is the, the, the difference that, uh, uh, and the attitude towards professional military education uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the services then and compared to today. Um, the Naval War College, of course, uh, was at the heart of this. Um, it reflected, if you will, um, the fact that one of the, uh, if you will, um, uh, real thinkers of naval strategy, Mahan, Admiral uh, Thayer Mahan, uh, Albert Thayer Mahan, had uh, 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 been the founding professor as a Navy captain, and then after he retired, continued to teach at the Naval War College and produced uh, um, books that were important, not just for naval theory, which proved out to be wrong, in the second, but in fact, for the emphasis on leadership, uh, and uh, particularly combat leadership of the Royal Navy uh, uh, in the Napoleonic and Revolutionary Wars. Um, the importance of the Naval War College, I think, is underlined by, at least in terms of the Navy culture of the 20s and 30s, uh, and uh, well into uh, uh, the uh, Second World War is underlined by the fact that when the First World War was over, the senior, one of the senior American admirals, who very clearly could have been CNO or chief of the <coughs> U.S. fleet, um, uh, Admiral Sims, chose to come back for his last tour to teach at the Naval War College. Um, similar thing happened at the end of World War II. Admiral Spruance, who could have had any command that he wanted, uh, in the United States Navy, given his uh, brilliant performance uh, as uh, commander of, uh, of uh, one of the major fleets uh, in the uh, Pacific War, chose to come back to be president. Now, what Sims did was to set up a war gaming uh, of, if you will, not just uh, the battleships that the Navy possessed uh, at that time, but if you will, what a Navy using carriers uh, and the implications of the air power off of those carriers would hold uh, in the future. And one of the crucial insights uh, of, that, uh, of those wargaming things was that the determinant of naval power that based on carriers would be pulses of air power rather than a stream of, uh, of artillery uh, 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 big guns being fired by battleships. And that insight led them to the conclusion that the crucial element in terms of carriers, sort of there'd be three crucial elements. First, strike, crucial. Second, the number of aircraft your carrier could uh, launch and then recover eventually. Uh, and third, the capacity to keep that uh, uh, that uh, combat force together. So the pulse of naval uh, um, power was going to be crucial. And, and here is again one of those sort of elements marking the 20s and 30s in Navy PMA is that the head of the tactics department, a captain named Reeves, then went from Newport to take over command of the uh, uh, USS Langley, first carrier the United States Navy possessed. And in um, a period of one year, turned that in from a ship that could carry about um, 11 or 12 aircraft to a, a, a ship that could um, carry um, somewhere around 40 aircraft, launch them and recover them. That involved the invention of the deck park, that involved the invention of the, uh, of the crash barrier, that invention that involved a number of other uh, uh, crucial inventions. Clearly, you see a symbiosis between the thinking at the Naval War College and, and the actual development of, um, of, um, uh, of uh, carrier aviation. And when in the late 1920s, the US uh, Navy acquired uh, um, the completion of the battle cruiser turned into carriers, the Saratoga and Lexington, 37, 38,000 ton ships, um, those uh, carriers were able to carry 100 aircraft. Now, what's particularly interesting in terms of this development is the British had carriers. They never glommed on to the fact of crash barriers, never glommed on to the idea 
of actually trying to mass the number of aircraft you could put. So that um, the famous British strike uh, at Taranto uh, against the Italian battle fleet uh, in uh, November of 1940, um, the British had 12 aircraft. That's all they could launch from an, air, from an aircraft carrier. Um, so, the, so the war gaming played a crucial role. Now, along with that came fleet exercises. Uh, <coughs> fleet exercises occurred once a year, and in terms of, of, of actually um, uh, uh, having an impact, um, it played an a, 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 a crucial role uh, in, if you will, um, uh, the, uh, both maybe culture uh, and in the, the testing out of new ideas and, um, if you will, the expansion uh, um, and uh, um, of capabilities. Finally, uh, let, let me say in terms of sort of initial storyline, um, the Navy possessed a, a culture of openness to argument and debate. Um, and again, I'll, I'll emphasize this in a moment when we talk about uh, the fleet exercises. But the result of, if you will, these intellectual developments during the 20s and 30s is that faced with, if you will, the worst of all possibilities, namely the sinking of uh, most of the battle fleet at Pearl Harbor, the Navy was able to improvise and adapt the conditions that uh, confronted uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in the uh, first uh, uh, second world war. Let me go on uh, to the next uh, slide. Naval War College. Um, number of factors here um, uh, uh, mentioned. Admiral Sims already. Let, let me say one of the interesting aspects of this is that uh, um, attendance at the War College was de rigueur. Not true of the Navy today. Um, uh, for senior officers. Uh, most of them went to the junior course as well. Um, but not just that, attendant uh, um, uh, um, service on the faculty was career enhancing uh, in terms of the Navy in the 20s and 30s. Um, among major figures of the Navy who um, were to be great figures, admirals in the Second World War, Spruance, Turner, Conley, all were on the faculty of the Naval War College um, for a substantial period. In fact, Spruance had two tours at Newport. Um, one tour today is enough to finish a Naval officer's career. Um, two tours Spruance had, it, it did not stop him from being, uh, I think, the most effective fleet commander the Navy had in the Second World War. Development of serious <coughs> war gaming, and one of the aspects which uh, I and some of my colleagues would like to t take a close look at is the actual conduct of, of the, of, of the uh, war games done at Newport in terms of, uh, of, of trying to understand how technological changes and capabilities was going to expand the possibilities open uh, to uh, naval forces uh, in the coming years. Uh, these were, by the way, both strategic and tactical. And the strategic ones were particularly important because by the early 1930s, um, uh, late 1920s, actually, the Navy, uh, uh, Navy uh, war games had indicated that the Philippines could not be defended. Um, uh, and even more important, that the last thing the Navy should do would be to seek a Mahanian journey across the Pacific to fight the Japanese at the beginning of the war. But in fact, any um, strategy to fight the Japanese was going to have to involve a step-by-step seizure of islands um, across the Central Pacific um, as a means to build up the bases uh, from which eventually uh, to uh, um, fight the Japanese uh, um, uh, around the home islands. Um, and of course, what made that particularly, in terms of informing the Marine Corps um, uh, and connecting with the Marine Corps is that uh, that pushed the Marines into understanding that, that uh, a crucial role in the future for them was going to be at the now, there was a lot of bitching after the Second World War with the Marines saying, oh, the Navy never supported us. A lot of these concepts and ideas could not be supported because the money and the resources were not available. But the ideas were there, such as, uh, among other things, uh, Admiral Nimitz, a student at the Naval War College, suggested that one of the uh, major elements uh, 
uh, in a future campaign of Pacific was going to have to be um, uh, at sea replenishment, which nobody else had ever thought of doing before. The necessity, if you will, to refuel and resupply uh, um, the fleet at sea uh, in terms of keeping it going. And of course, uh, there was no possibility of doing that in the 20s and 30s with the monies available. By 1944, with huge resources that we poured into the Battle of Pacific, we were keeping, keeping either third fleet, uh, which I believe was under Spruance, I ne never get it right, and the fifth fleet uh, under Halsey, at sea, same fleet, different command, just alternated with each other. We were able to keep it at sea permanently from, from the beginning of 1944 to the end of the war. The U.S. fleet, the Pacific Main Fleet, Task Force 58, uh, the major portion of it uh, was at sea um, permanently. And then individual ships, when they needed refitting or, or whatever, were brought back to Pearl to um, be refitted. Um, so the uh, strategic games, if you will, understood the, uh, and underlined the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the issues that the Navy was going to have to think about. And one of the, again, in terms of strategic understanding that I found particularly interesting was <laughs> naval officers, when they came to the conclusion that it was going to take a sustained long-term campaign across the Central Pacific to defeat the Japanese, um, came to the conclusion at the same time we're going to have a real problem keeping the American people uh, supporting a long-term three, four-year campaign. Um, and in fact, of course, as we all know, the Japanese took care of that problem by uh, attacking Pearl Harbor. And so the support was there. But again, I think in terms of, of understanding the complexities of the war, the difficulties that you confront in fighting a war, um, uh, understanding the political and strategic long-term effects was, uh, was, again, a piece of brilliance. Um, red teaming. What's clear is that both in terms of the exercises run at Newport uh, and the exercises uh, um, conducted, uh, um, the fleet exercises which occurred each year, um, red teaming played an essential element uh, in, uh, if you will, the education and the innovation within the Navy. And oh, by the way, um, if you, you did well uh, in, uh, um, uh, in exercises, <coughs> exercises, um, it played a role in who got promoted and who didn't get promoted. Let me go to the next slide. What you see, and I've discussed some of these issues already, but what you see in terms of the 20s and 30s uh, is that the Navy was both lucky and very smart, and as Napoleon said, it does not ever hurt a, a really first-rate general to be lucky as well. And in fact, most first-rate generals are lucky. Washington Treaty of 1922, um, uh, which basically got rid of large numbers of battleships uh, possessed by the United States and by Britain, um, created a situation in which the United States, as I mentioned, had two large battle cruisers under construction that were about half done. Uh, and the Navy never likes to throw things away. Um, and so they came up with the idea that since they had tonnage for aircraft carriers, hey, um, let's turn them into aircraft carriers. And <coughs> both of those were, um, um, were um, uh, again, played a major role in the Second World War. Saratoga survived the war. Lexington went down uh, at, uh, at, uh, at Coral Sea. Again, what's rather interesting is in terms of the development of innovation, when they first came on board in the late 20s and 30s, aircraft capabilities were such that the Navy was not sure that, uh, uh, that uh, these very big ships um, would spend their whole time doing carriers. So they both were armed with eight, eight inch guns, cruiser guns, which the Navy then took off in 1940 um, because they recognized that, in fact, the stupidest thing you could do would be to try and use an aircraft carrier as a cruiser. But in terms of the kick, again, this is where it's very easy to accuse the Navy of being stupid in the 20s when they designed it. But given aircraft capabilities, it made some sense uh, um, uh, uh, to use combat capabilities that a 35,000 ton ship uh, could have. <clears throat> I think 
concepts, very interesting, both in terms of wargaming and fleet exercises, were tested under very rigorous conditions and were evaluated very toughly um, by uh, umpires, usually from the Naval War College in terms of fleet exercises. Um, and in addition, um, a, a, a willingness to feed the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, what had been learned in uh, fleet exercises and the hot washes that took place afterward back into the system, particularly educational system at the Naval War College. So you get at the Naval uh, War College a real symbiosis and a real understanding of what's happening actually out there in the fleet. There was one weakness. Um, There's a wonderful moment in one of those fleet exercises in which the admirals are talking, and I'm going to come back to who they're talking to, um, uh, but one of them, uh, the uh, CNO says, um, Admiral so-and-so, commander of the Black Fleet or whatever, what a great job he did. And he says, and you know, it's inconceivable that the Japanese could do anything that effective. Um, again, we learned a real lesson uh, in uh, 1942. Uh, that in fact the Japanese were um, a lot more effective than uh, we thought. Here we go to the next one, uh, Navy culture. Um, culture of the officer corps. And this is where outside influences played a significant, uh, had a significant impact on, uh, on if you will, the over -cult overall culture of, of the officer corps. Uh, in, 1925, there was something called the Morrow Board, which looked at the issue of what were we going to do with American air power, the fact that there was an Army Air Corps and there was a uh, very clearly a Navy group of aviators. <coughs> and um, they eventually came down on the idea that we would have uh, uh, Naval Air Force uh, and Army Air Forces, again, I think, uh, work very much to our advantage uh, in the Second World War. Um, but one of the issues uh, that uh, came up that uh, the uh, naval aviators were able to persuade Congress to do was the idea that uh, uh, carriers could only be commanded by aviators, could not be commanded by any surface animal. That, uh, uh, that uh, now, what in terms of, of the uh, Navy's uh, overall culture is there was a there was a a fluttering of commanders who, who suddenly decided to get aviator qualified. Uh, Admiral Halsey became a pilot. Um, uh, and I'm happy to say that nobody ever let him take off or land a carrier uh, on a carrier because he was a terrible pilot. But that experience very clearly gave him um, if you will, um, a sense of what flying aircraft off carriers actually involved. Um, uh, and a number of other uh, individuals in which this did. And, and here the, the huge difference, of course, uh, is that um, for the most part, with the one exception of Spruance, who was a very wide, deep thinker, um, the major carrier forces of the United States were, carry, were commanded by carrier admirals. Um, the Japanese however, uh, because they did not follow that same path, uh, ended up having their carrier force commanded by Admiral Nagumo, uh, who was a very much of a battleship bureaucrat admiral, uh, who saved our bacon, by the way, at Pearl Harbor by only launching two strikes. Uh, his aviators wanted a third strike to take out the oil there, which would have put us back to uh, fleet operating out of San Diego for the next year, with obvious impact. Um, <clears throat> what I found particularly interesting was fleet exercises, and I'd recommend the Nafi book on this because it is a, a, a very careful study of each one of the fleet exercises, uh, four or five pages of what, what, what actually occurred. Um, sometimes it's red on blue, sometimes it's black on uh, blue, um, uh, whatever. Um, but whoever was <coughs> doing, the red, doing the fighting, and, and you were given certain number of ships, you see all sorts of innovative things, like uh, 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 one of the first uh, um, um, uh, fleet exercises to use the, uh, um, one of the big new carriers uh, uh, managed to sneak in and destroy the Panama Canal. Uh, you have two incidences uh, during the 30s in which uh, um, 
fleet commanders uh, uh, pick their carriers and attack Pearl Harbor. Yeah, it's one of those sort of interesting comments on, if you will, the incapacity to draw the lesson of, boy, if, if we did really well in attacking the uh, American fleet and the aircraft on Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, maybe the Japanese would do that. That never crossed anybody's mind. Um, now, what makes these, I, I found as, a, as an historian and, and, and an individual who spent a lot of time studying military history and uh, um, spending a, a considerable amount of time with the U.S. military over the last 40 years, or maybe 50 years, we go back to the Air Force a long time ago. Um, what's particularly, I found interesting, were the hot washes after major fleet exercises. And what made them particularly interesting is, is that really serious, ferocious debates took place among the admirals as to how they had done with uh, senior admirals who were observers like the Chief of Naval Operations being willing to very seriously criticize their subordinates and, uh, and the subordinates to argue back. Now, what makes this even more interesting is that on a couple of cases, um, those hot washes took place in front of all of the officers who had served in the fleet exercise. So in one case, there is a, a literally a hot wash taking place before 700 uh, junior and mid-rank officers listening to the admirals criticize each other uh, and discuss what should have been done and why it should have been done, uh, and in some cases telling each other that they didn't have a clue what, <coughs> what they were doing. Um, the, result, which I found, again, very interesting, was a ruthless criticism of senior officer performance with an impact on careers. Admiral uh, Reeves, the guy who had taken the uh, Langley as a captain uh, in, the, uh, um, in 1923, um, in the mid-1930s was in competition, which everybody thought he would lose to be the uh, commander of the U.S. Fleet, uh, commander-in-chief U.S. Fleet, the acronym which uh, Admiral King changed. The acronym works out to be SINCUS U.S. Fleet, which is not exactly <laughs> what Admiral King thought we needed in 1942. Um, but uh, uh, Reeves did outstandingly in the uh, fleet exercise, um, uh, uh, beat his opponent thoroughly, uh, and the result was that Reeves was picked to be the Commander-in-Chief U.S. Fleet uh, over an individual who everybody else thought was going to be. Honest reporting about what had happened in the hot wash and in the fleet exercise then was passed around the fleet uh, extensively and was used as part of the curriculum at the Naval War College. That I am, sh am sure of. Um, and then finally, let me say that, as I said a little bit earlier, um, the general board was a sounding board for new ideas. Not a bunch of old fogey admirals, but admirals who really had brains and interest in their service and a willingness to try and uh, spread new ideas throughout the Navy. Let me go to the next slide. Use Colin Gray's wonderful phrase, the Navy got it right enough in World War II, which is a very high grade given the general performance of military organizations throughout the <coughs> centuries. So they point out that if you look throughout the century, military organizations have a record of 50 percent because there's always a loser and always a winner. Um, not everybody was a rocket scientist in the Navy. Uh, very clearly, we were lucky that uh, Admiral Kimmel never had a chance uh, to take the fleet out, uh, the Japanese having sunk it, because Admiral Kimmel was a battleship admiral. And now, the reason he got that appointment was because a far more effective um, uh, and imaginative admiral, Ad Admiral Richardson was his name, um, was fired by Roosevelt because Richardson kept complaining to Roosevelt that, that his Navy, the Navy was being put out on a limb at Pearl Harbor. The dangers of the Japanese attacking Roosevelt finally got tired of hearing missives, uh, so he fired him and appointed Kimmel. Um, <clears throat> Kimmel obviously got fired for Pearl Harbor, deserved to get fired for Pearl Harbor, um, along with the uh, Army Air Force, uh, Army guy who was a uh, three-star who was there. 
Um, and again, this is where, uh, if you will, the luck of who is the president plays a great role in military effectiveness. And whatever Franklin Roosevelt's weaknesses, and he had them, like all presidents, he was very good at picking people. And I think um, the U.S. Army's performance in the Second World War in terms of George Marshall being picked uh, um, um, absolutely essential to the fact that we were able to not only get troops in combat two years after the Army began rearming in July 1940, but uh, the performance of the U.S. Army uh, forces uh, by 1944-45. Um, similarly, um, uh, Roosevelt's picking of King to be the uh, uh, CNO and then Sinkus together, and then he got rid of the Sinkus and just made the CNO as the head of the uh, Navy. Um, King is a figure who clearly today would not make it to any military organization's top. Uh, he was a alcoholic, not alcoholic, he drank like a fish um, <laughs> without it affecting him. Um, he was uh, nasty to um, uh, everybody around him, including his family. His daughter remembered him as being permanently angry. Um, uh, he was a womanizer, chased his junior the wives of his junior officers. There's nothing in ter personal terms that you could say that was nice about King. But as my colleague uh, uh, Alan Millett said, King was a consummate professional who understood the Navy uh, and its strengths and weaknesses and foibles and who were the first rate people to appoint, uh, appoint to important positions. The one mistake he made was the uh, appointment of Admiral a Andrews to be a, 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 a in charge of the uh, anti-submarine war uh, against the Germans. Uh, and uh, in, in late 1941 and early 42, uh, and that partially reflects the fact that King didn't give a damn about the Atlantic. In fact, he hoped the Brits would sink with the Japanese. Uh, but in terms of fighting the war against the Japanese, um, the guy he had picked, it, uh, picked Nimitz, uh, managed, if you will, to deal extraordinarily well with uh, uh, his colleagues in the Army. And actually, I have to say, the one person that King got along with, uh, besides the President, uh, was uh, George Marshall. That was partially due to the fact that George Marshall understood how important King was going to be uh, to the war effort and the Navy was going to be the war. Um, we have a period of, of of innovation and adaptation that takes place between 8 December 1941 July 1943. Uh, it is one in which uh, um, uh, U.S. forces, particularly the Solomons and New Guinea, uh, paid a very heavy price, uh, particularly the Navy uh, in terms of iron bombs sound. Um, some people argue that the Navy had learned its lesson in Pearl Harbor. It did not learn its lesson in Pearl Harbor. Savo Island was the wake-up call for the U.S. Navy. Because in Savo Island, Three Japanese cruisers sank four, uh, three American, one Australian cruiser uh, in, a, in a matter of minutes and then went home without being damaged. Um, the great gift we got, of course, was Midway, where Admiral Nugumo showed why he should not have been in charge of the Japanese uh, uh, Great Battle. And then finally, in terms of the Navy's impact of the Second World War, um, Plan Orange from July 1943 to August 1945 was the Navy's great contribution uh, in terms of strategic thinking to uh, uh, U.S. victory in the Second World War. Let, let me point out that um, uh, the great landings that took place in the Central Pacific um, reflected not only uh, the, uh, uh, the Navy, uh, the Marine Corps' uh, capabilities in amphibious warfare, but the adaptation of the Army uh, uh, as well, uh, and particularly, I think, of Pete Corlett, uh, and how the 7th Division was handled uh, at Saipan. Uh, and a very good book by uh, Sharon Lacey uh, on, in fact, what turns out to have been rather close friendship and cooperation between the uh, Army and the Marine Corps in the Pacific, with the exception of two really nasty individuals, Howling Man Smith. Uh, his name was Holland Man, Holland Smith. But his nickname, quite correctly, was Howling Man Smith. Uh, and uh, an Army General named Richardson. The two of them never got along, and, and, and 
howling man was a disaster. Let me uh, give you some takeaways from history. Uh, you can uh, ask whatever questions uh, you want to ask. First of all, the fundamental nature of war will not change. Friction, ambiguity, uncertainty will always be there. It does not and will not change. Among other reasons for that, of course, is we live in a nonlinear universe. We live in a universe in which, uh, in which uh, um, it's, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to, to predict the future. And uh, in which every action you take, the enemy will take an action, uh, and which unintended effects um, will always um, come up to catch you up, uh, and um, um, third, fourth order effects which cannot be predicted will always influence uh, the course of events. Third point, strategy matters. Alan Millett and I wrote this after our study on, uh, on military effectiveness in the late 1980s. If you get the strategy right, deficiencies at the tactical and operational level can be repaired. If you get the strategy wrong, and the Germans proved this in two world wars, no matter how brilliant you are at the tactical level or operational level, you lose. You lose. Fourth point, the enemy always gets a vote. And here is one of the things that I think I'm even more worried of than about than our sort of military problems right now. Understanding the other is crucial. And I would argue that when we have a central intelligence agency in which 17 of the seven, only 17 percent of the analysts speak a foreign language, we have a problem. We have a really big problem in understanding the other. Finally. Let me emphasize crucial importance of senior military leaders providing strategic as well as operational advice to civilian leaders. Again, we are going to confront a world in which more and more of our civilian leaders will have had no military experience uh, and in which um, uh, military advice is going to become essential so that we do, do not repeat the mistakes that we made in uh, that, I'll conclude and take any questions that you have. Yes, we have a question back here. Thank you. Hey, Sir Mitchell Lavin, um, Future Warfare Division. I was wondering if you could comment quickly um, in the 20s and the 30s with the Navy innovation. Obviously, we had the Great Depression at the time as well. Um, I think you were alluding to one of the trade offs being amphibious warfare. Were there other trade offs the Navy had to make, and how did they manage those uh, sort of defenders of the rice bowls? that the doctrine was, um, if you will, imbued in war games and fleet exercises into an officer corps that, uh, uh, um, that was willing and capable of learning. Uh, and it, it's, to be perfectly frank, the advantage that uh, the Navy has uh, is that when uh, um, the, uh, the captain of a uh, carrier uh, tells his uh, ship 5,000 people to, to take a 90 degree turn, they all take a 90 degree turn. Um, when you've got, you got 50 guys uh, in a, a platoon and you tell them to take a right turn, there's no absolute guarantee that they're going to take a, a turn, as many of you have discovered. I, I, think, I think what you get in terms of naval experience um, uh, and doctrine is an understood um, uh, capability, which when you get to World War II, 
uh, which the Navy discovers that it's not good at war fighting. And in the, in the battles uh, around Savo Island, uh, the, the area called Iron Bottom Sound for a real reason, um, the Navy had to adapt. Uh, and its advantage from the night, night fighting was it had, had to learn over a three month period how to use radar, which the Japanese didn't have. Once we learned how to use radar at night, we had no problems at night. But it took time to adapt, um, if you will, uh, pre-war practices to what actually uh, you were going to do uh, in wartime. Um, and again, this is where innovation and adaptation connect. Barry Watson and I argued in, in an essay in the innovation uh, study that um, while innovation and adaptation are quite different, they rest on the same basic principles of, of a willingness to question, a willingness to argue, a willingness to to, if you will, um, uh, challenge ideas uh, and try and figure out what actually is happening as opposed to what you hope is and, and would like to think is happening. Here, here you go. Do I use this? I've often wanted to ask you this question got a chance to do that. And, and I'm sure it's, it's often asked and often answered, but I think it's worth asking and answering uh, many times as we interpret history and as you've done for us today. But what, how would you interpret the effect on, on you know, lessons and the takeaways and so forth of, of enigma and magic and, and that sort of, uh, those kinds of capabilities vis-a-vis -vis what we, what lessons have we actually learned and how did those affect us? Well, the initial uh, surprise of Enigma, uh, which again, you, uh, the World War II generation is quite different than ours, the secret of Enigma was kept until 1975. 30 years, about 15,000, 20,000 people kept their mouths shut. And, you know, living in D.C. these days, uh, that's, uh, that's unimaginable that five people can keep their mouths shut. Um, <coughs> the initial reaction was, oh my God, now we understand, we understood everything, da 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 da. Well, the problem is that, um, uh, is that even an intelligence source as effective at, as Enigma presents some problems. And uh, I, I think it's very instructive in terms of thinking about intelligence and its difficulties. Um, I think the best example, uh, and I'll give a, a very favorable, a, a very negative example, uh, is the Arnhem operation. And one of the sort of, um, and I've been through the whole huge pile of Enigma decrypts, which, oh, by the way, go from the absolutely crucial important items to things like a trawler off of Norway reporting that one of the sailors had a bad case of VD and could they come back early. Um, not, not exactly moments of great world historical importance. Um, uh, on the 5th of September, uh, 1944, there's an Enigma dispatch which says, 9th and 10th SS Panzer divisions um, being re-stationed at uh, um, Arnheim uh, and uh, Her uh, Hergewasch um, for rest and refit. And it's repeated the next day, same message. Um, of course, I think as many of you know, 11 days later, um, we go into a, uh, and the Brits go into uh, the market garden and discover the 9th and 10th SS divisions there. Here's the problem. The problem is that the guys who were reading Ultra were never given access to what Blue was doing. And so what to us, and as a number of historians before some people came along, uh, Ralph Bennett was on this, um, and said, wait a minute. Um, uh, historians said, well, here it was. Why didn't they? The answer is that uh, the adults looking at it, uh, absolutely no significance from their point of view because they didn't know we were going to be dropping a, a massive airborne army uh, in that area. Uh, and so that just simply goes into the large pile of stuff that historians can go through and say, why wasn't that discovered? Well, you have to look at the context. And 
Um, now, in terms of, of ultra playing a absolutely crucial um, uh, is the, uh, uh, at the end of May, towards the end of May, uh, 8th Air Force uh, getting permission to move away for a couple raids um, uh, um, on the French Railroad Network, which they were all concentrating on. Um, got, uh, Spots got permission to go and bomb uh, the major German uh, synthetic oil factories in Luna. And they go and they drop a whole bunch of bombs, 600, 700 uh, B-17s. Um, that didn't tell them much, because the, uh, the, uh, uh, they actually weren't that accurate. Uh, and the damage was pretty insignificant. But the crucial piece of ulcer came the next day when the Germans transferred about 20% uh, of the anti-aircraft guns to protect uh, these synthetic oil places. And right away, that message is at the top, saying this is clearly an absolutely crucial target center. The Germans would not be moving a substantial portion of the anti-aircraft guns to be protected. Uh, of course, you had to have an analyst capable of, of understanding that. And here, uh, again, I think this is what worries <coughs> me about our current intelligence organizations. Is, um, uh, is the fact that Bletchley Park, towards the analysts uh, that went through it, were an extraordinary bunch of not only the Turing, and the, and the movie is somewhat of an exaggeration of the, the ultra part of it, um, uh, uh, but exceptionally bright, incredibly bright people. And my favorite example is a guy named F.H. Hinsley, who became one of the great British historians after the war. 1921, uh, he was a... Um, uh, 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 excuse me, not 1921, 1939, um, he was a Cambridge undergraduate, uh, visited Germany to work on his German, which was nearly perfect, uh, and actually got out of Germany on the 2nd of September. You know, one German sergeant said, no, nah, no, nah, I don't like your look, you're staying here in the right till tomorrow. He would have been uh, uh, locked up for the rest of the war. <clears throat> Comes back, uh, and because of the way a lot of intelligence agencies eventual CIA were recruited. <coughs> the British, uh, you know, went to Cambridge and got any bright guys around. And so they take this 21-year-old, or 20-year-old actually, in 1939, who knows, who's got no, he doesn't even have his degree yet, um, but he knows German. So, okay, would you like to work in Intel there? He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, that's a great idea. So they send him uh, to Bletchley Park, and they, Bletchley Park, they look and say, what are you doing with this, this kid? Uh, and so they say, hey, why don't you uh, uh, take one or two others and put you in charge of uh, mapping out what the codes for the German <coughs> ships are? Oh, okay. So he goes and does it. And two months later, he comes back and he's got all the code uh, letters identified for every single German uh, warship. Okay, so he's just doing menial stuff in the background. Um, early April, he comes to the uh, his uh, bosses and he says, well, you know, um, there's a huge amount of traffic very clearly the German signals uh, the ships are being moved, and I think something really big is about to happen. Thank you very much, Mr. Hensley, and, back in the and two days later, Denmark and Norway get invaded, and the Brits are completely surprised. Um, end of May, again, he goes to his boss and says, you know, um, I've been looking at the uh, movement of German ships and uh, German codes, uh, code signs for ships, and I think that the German battlecruisers Scharnhorst and Eisner are out. Um, and they could be off the North Cape. Uh, thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. Hensley. Go back to your corner. Uh, two, two days later, the carrier to Glorious is sunk by the uh, Gneisen and the Scharnhorst. At that point, and this is, this is where you, you get the difference between Intel then and now. Um, they said, ah, oh, we got a diamond here. Mr. Hensley, we're going to put you at the top of looking at the U.S. <coughs> And in March of 1941, sitting at his desk, as he says uh, in a wonderful little piece he wrote, I'm looking out the window, I suddenly thought to myself, oh, the, the Germans and the Brits have not broken the U-boat code yet. Hmm, you know, kind of strange that the Germans would be using their U-boat codes in the weather ships that are off Iceland, not submarines sitting off Iceland. And he says, oh my God, that's where we can take it out and get the, 
and get the settings for Ultra. And so he goes to, uh, goes to his bosses and to the Admiralty. They launch a cutting out expedition on the basis of a 21-year-old Cambridge undergraduate of three heavy cruisers and four destroyers. And they capture the mention um, with the settings, and that's one of the major factors in the breaking of the, of the uh, uh, naval ultra. So again, this is, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, like all things, the information provided by even uh, intercepts like Enigma is always doubtful and uncertain and requires an individual with extraordinary, if you will, imagination, which is why an operational commanders require the same thing, imagination. Your, your husband, ma'am, in terms of, uh, I wrote a book with Bob Scales about it, uh, going downtown. Nobody in the Army thought he was going to go out. He had that intuition that uh, the Iraqis were, were on the tipping point and, and clearly broke uh, Saddam's resistance anyway um, uh, in those downtown runs. It, it's, it, this is what's so difficult to predict in terms of, of who will be really, truly effective commanders in, in, in war and who will not and who will fail. Uh, does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, sir. Scott Potts from Operations. In uh, reading the chapter in which you discussed today, uh, was the Navy being innovative or were they just modernizing and learning those tools and how to employ those tools during that 20 years from 1920 to 1940? I think, I think it's obviously both, but I think I put the major emphasis on innovation because, in fact, what clearly they were thinking of in terms of the early 20s, in terms of Sims and the initial war games that read, uh, are capable capabilities far beyond what our capabilities we have now. And, I, and then they push, um, um, uh, if you will, the tactics of actually running an aircraft carrier uh, and maximizing air power uh, and then pushing the technological development of the radial engine and, uh, and the uh, kind of aircraft. So, you know, it, it, it's obviously both, but in this case, I, I really say it's, uh, argue it's innovation. And that's why looking at the, uh, uh, at the Nafi book, um, which is fascinating because it's got all nice little maps and nice, nice pictures. But, but the account of, of what happens in these exercises uh, and the level of imagination. By the way, one of the people who attacked uh, uh, Hawaii Pearl Harbor and got rid of all the Army uh, Air Force, uh, 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 excuse me, Army Air Corps uh, aircraft on Hickam uh, was no, other, no one else but Admiral King. Uh, and uh, um, uh, there was a lot of complaint on the Army side where you cheated. Um, again, I, I would argue the difference between, because then the, the opposing force against Quick King had, had to work without the Army guys being available uh, because they lost them all. Um, a very big difference from uh, what I would argue the Millennium Challenge disaster where uh, General Van Riper managed to sink four Navy carriers. Uh, um, and the game was then restarted. Uh, I think they <laughs> resurrected two Navy carriers, which magically uh, all the left. And again, I, I would argue that those, that those kinds of exercises, um, uh, um, people should be made to pay for their mistakes. And, to, and then to have the, uh, you know, the hot wash underline, the kind of, of, of if you will, um, superficial analysis that allowed the, the guys running the carrier carriers to say, well, the Iranians would never be able to launch an attack with the be of us. No. They were wrong. Now, unfortunately, my guess is the Iranians have bothered to read the, uh, you know, the public press that then came out of that because Van Riper uh, uh, quit in annoyance of what he thought was cheating. Yes, sir. Sir, Major Lang from uh, Joint Army Concepts. Uh, one of the more successful pieces of the Pacific War was the American submarine campaign. And I was wondering if you could address how much of that was pre-war innovation and how much of it was adaptation after, after Pearl Harbor and what can we learn from that going forward? <coughs> um, 
it's both an enthralling story and uh, it really annoys you in terms of what bureaucracies are capable of doing and preventing. Um, the development of fleet boats is very interesting in terms of comparison to the German uh, uh, equivalent. The German equivalent would be the Type 12, um, about 1,200 ton boat. One of, one of the initial arguments that took place in terms of the uh, design of the boat was should it have air conditioning? And a lot of the old submarines said, oh, no, you know, you got to go down there and be in the humid, rotten, miserable conditions to be a true submariner. Uh, and they lost. And one of the advantages of the U.S. fleet boats was that, in fact, had very low humidity because you, had a, you were able to strip out the humidity um, uh, when on the surface. Um, and um, uh, the, the boat, now here's where the innovation comes in, uh, or adaptation comes in. Very interesting to compare the German twi Type 12, or Type 7 for that matter, um, uh, over a three-year period, from 1939-1942. If you look at the boats coming out of uh, San Nazare or any of those other major French harbors in Brest that they came out of, they look exactly the same as they did in 1939. No technological improvements, because the Germans were only interested, donuts improved, in tactical improvements, which they were quite good at, as we discovered mm -hmm. out of the Atlantic. You look at a, a type, uh, a U.S. fleet boat, in 1941, and then in 43, and it's entirely different. The, the 43 boat has um, two or three different kinds of radar, surface radar, um, aircraft radar, um, all sorts of uh, radio uh, uh, gear, um, uh, low frequency for very short range discussion with other submarines, a long range. It's got a, a huge amount of technological stuff on it because we, we were willing to fight the uh, we fought a, a technological as well as a tactical war in the Second World War. Um, the problem <clears throat> was that um, we had managed to, de to um, develop in the Second World War um, through the bureaucracies of the people in the Bureau of, uh, uh, I forget which bureau, I think the torpedo guys had their own bureau that was part of the weapons crew, uh, um, a torpedo that didn't work. Uh, and it didn't work for two reasons. One is that it had a magnetic detonator on it, which the Germans tried this as well, too. It didn't work very, very well for them, which was supposed to go underneath the ship um, and then explode underneath the ship. Because if you take the bottom off the ship, it's even better than taking the side off, for obvious reasons. Um, the problem was that uh, um, when they tested it, they tested it um, uh, at Newport, which is the big uh, torpedo school. Tested it. Actually, it was one in, in, in uh, Alexandria too. They tested it um, uh, without a full warhead on it, so it was much lighter than the than a than a than a, uh, a, a, a torpedo that was actually a, um, uh, had uh, um, uh, an explosive uh, explosives on board. So unfortunately, the uh, torpedoes that the uh, U.S. Navy was equipped with through early '43. Were, were torpedoes that uh, ran about 20 feet too deep, which meant that they were too deep to, uh, to uh, explode underneath ships. Uh, and submarine, again, historians have blasted the Navy for being unprepared for submarine warfare. Virtually all the submarine skippers got um, fired because they weren't doing any good. And the answer, the reason why they weren't doing any good was, if you don't have a torpedo, you're not going to do very well. Uh, now the second problem with the torpedo, when they realized they had a problem with the um, with the magnetic detonator, was to take that off and to start firing their torpedoes um, um, at a much lower, a much higher depth, much closer to the surface, at ships. And uh, they were having problems with that too, really major problems with that. And finally, a submarine skipper ran across a uh, a Japanese um, uh, tank very valuable, uh, and fired off a set of three or four torpedoes. Um, three, they could hear distinct clanks, no explosion. The last one, at an angle, blew the, uh, uh, the propellers and the uh, uh, rudder off of the tanker. So there was a tanker sitting there. So this um, uh, Navy uh, um, Lieutenant Command, 
boat commander uh, took his submarine about a um, thousand yards off and started firing torpedoes straight at the uh, um, at the tanker, and after, at each one he got a distinct clank. And he went back, and Nimitz was a former submer submariner, and this went to Nimitz, and still the, the, uh, the uh, Bureau of Ordnance, that's what the Bureau I'm talking about, um, was saying, it's all the skipper's fault. Um, they're idiots, and they're cowards, and they're lying, and there's nothing wrong with the torpedoes. And uh, so Nimitz had to take up to torpedoes out, um, and they fired them into some cliff uh, in the Hawaiian Islands, and they did exactly what they did. They, they went bang, clunk, uh, and uh, what happened was the detonator was too fragile. It simply collapsed. If you managed to fire it at an angle, um, it then wouldn't take the full pressure of a hit uh, and would go off, which is why they knocked the, uh, the, the submarine I mentioned. Uh, and Nimitz went to King, and King fixed the problem. Uh, when, when, when wanted a problem fixed, Ernie King was there to shoot people and throw them uh, off the deck and whatever else. Uh, and from that point on, we were then, now here, here was the huge advantage that we got. Having been completely unsuccessful, or largely unsuccessful through summer 43, the Japanese had done no preparations for, for us to, uh, um, for, for an anti-submarine campaign. And so when we start really get going with torpedoes that work, We've got crews and skippers who have um, been educated in the harsh world of war um, and uh, are really effective. And then, you know, we actually could have stopped the war and sunk all the Japanese ships and uh, waited for, for them to surrender, which would have been about, without the atomic bombs, about, uh, I would say, 1982. <laughs> Please join me giving Wick another round of applause. Yeah.